Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. How are you today? Good. My name is Mary Penn. I'm the marketing manager for the Bay County Library System. And I'm very pleased to be here today with you. I'm glad you all could make it. Um, there are just a few things that I need to talk about before we get started today. Uh, October is National Book Club Month. And the Bay County Library System would like for you to submit a paperback title that your book club would like to read. And if your title is selected, your group will be able to check that out before anybody else. Um, a couple other things we have in our newsletter. I hope that everybody receives our newsletter either by mail or email. This comes out bi-monthly, and it tells you pretty much everything that you need to know about what's going on here at the Bay County Library System. Coming up very quickly, we have Jonathan Rand. Jonathan Rand is actually a, a children's author. Um, he's done the American Chiller series, the Michigan Chiller series, and he's going to be doing a family presentation that is geared for children in grades one through six and their adult partners. Um, on Thursday, October 8th, from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. at the State Theater. Now, kids in elementary school absolutely will know who Jonathan Rand is, and we've had him come to town before. He's wonderful, wonderful. If you have uh, children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews that you would love to take, this is a wonderful thing because he's going to be using humor um, and his experience to talk about the importance of reading and writing and how it's the key to success in life. So it's a wonderful program. Um, it's at the State Theater, which is right downtown here in Bay City. Admission is absolutely free. So please do come. We also have on Wednesday, October 7th, from 1.30 to 6.30 p.m., uh, Michigan Blood Drive will be at the Auburn Area Branch Library. And they would like, if you could register, it would help, but you don't have to. Walk-ins are always, always welcome. So, <coughs> The next book for lunch that we have will be on Friday, October 9th, and George Heron will be reviewing Strange Glory, A Life of Dietrich Bonhoeffer by Charles Marsh. But today, we happen to have a very talented, artistic gentleman with us. His name is Thomas Ebelt. And in his civic life, Mr. Ebelt is a retired banker, an insurance agent, and is a member of MidMichigan Writers Incorporated. He was born in Bay City and attended Delta College. He's now a resident of West Branch, but he lived in New Mexico for 20 years, from 1975 to 1995. He's married to a lovely woman, I hear, very, very lovely, named Judith. And his love of the arts actually began at a very young age. Just before he was about 10 years old, he really got into illustration comics, really helped um, with the, all children to get in, into you know, the arts and drawing and things like that. And then he picked up a guitar shortly after. And since, has written over 150 songs. <laughs> very, very impressive. Um, we are pleased to be a part of his growing artistic repertoire, to have him here today because he's on his third novel. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, he's on his third novel, and he'll be presenting Black Sparrow for you today, which was his first. So without further ado, please help me to welcome Mr. Thomas E. Oh, I can't tell you how wonderful it is to be here today. <clears throat> I was born in Bay City, and my father was, and my grandfather was, in fact. He was, he was born in a log cabin off Salzburg Road, I hear. Uh, he was a poet, and his archives are at the Saginaw Valley College. My uh, father was a painter, and so I suspected that I would be doing something as I grew older, and I just didn't know what it was. So it turned out to be <clears throat> writing, songwriting, music. I've even done some painting and illustrating, but I really love writing. And I've just discovered writing since um, I retired. Um, Forty years ago, my wife and I had just gotten married. Uh, we lived in Pontiac at the time. And it was a cold winter that year. And um, we got married in early February, and a month later we said, well, by golly, let's go someplace where it's warm. <laughs> and so we went to the library, 
library is very important things to me. Went to the library, got a, an atlas of the United States, and we said, well, let's check out New Mexico or Arizona. So we sold our second car, put our furniture in storage, packed a couple bags, threw it in the back of an old Corvette that I had. And two weeks later, we were gone. We just left. And I can't believe we did such a thing. Didn't have a job or anything. We just took off. So uh, a few days later, we arrived uh, in Albuquerque in the middle of the night. Uh, stopped at the first motel on the edge of town we found and woke up in the morning and walked outside and the sky was full of hot air balloons. We said, this is the place. So we, we settled in Albuquerque. Um, by the end of that year, however, we moved further westward to Gallup. Have any of you heard of Gallup, New Mexico? It is in the heart of Indian country. And that is the, the thing that has inspired uh, my desire to write. We, uh, we came uh, under the influence, I, I would say, of the southwestern culture, the desert, the uh, ancient ruins, and, uh, and we got rid of that Corvette and we bought a truck so we could get around. <laughs> <laughs> So, what is Black Sparrow about? Black Sparrow is a mystery thriller. It's my first novel. And it took me about five and a half years to write because I had to learn how to write first. And it takes place in New Mexico in the 1930s. The, uh, most of the story takes place at a ruin called Chaco Canyon. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. It's about halfway between Albuquerque and Gallup. And it's a high, it's an old Pueblo ruin. It's through a valley called the Chaco Valley. And there are maybe a hundred different ruin sites through that valley. There's a, a Pueblo that was five stories tall, shaped like a big D against the cliffs. And uh, by the 1350s, the people disappeared from the entire valley. So it's a big mystery and it was uh, explored a lot in the 20s, but in the 30s, where my story takes place, uh, one of my characters is an archeologist who was working in that area. So there's a lot of uh, Indian culture, mystery, mysticism, and intrigue in this story. My main character is a Navajo policeman and uh, in the 30s, uh, uh, they, weren't, they didn't have a tribal police. It, it was run through the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the FBI kind of managed them a little bit. There's also a, uh, a spirit monster who has come to life uh, from the old Navajo tribal creation legends who was terrorizing the territory. There's a Nazi spy cell operating a mine in the area. Uh, they're mining uranium, and uranium is, is a, New Mexico is a big producer of uranium for uh, Hitler's war effort. And there are uh, a handful of flawed characters that are drawn, whoops, drawn to the center of where the action lies, which is the Black Sparrow Mine, where the Nazi spy cell is mining uranium. So that's how the title comes about. Everybody asks me, well, what is Black Sparrow? Well, I'm not going to tell you. You've got to read about it. <clears throat> what inspired me to write? Well, as I mentioned, it started when my wife and I moved to New Mexico. and. Uh, we started learning about the culture and also the Hispanic culture. It, um, I, heard, I read something in the news the other day that said, uh, it was talking about the pilgrims discovering America. They didn't discover America. It was, uh, well, in, uh, the Europeans that discovered America were the Hispanics. Santa Fe is the oldest constantly inhabited city 
in this whole country. It's not Florida, it's not uh, anywhere on the East Coast. So we, we moved to Gallup, and Gallup is a town near the west side of the state with a big Navajo reservation to the north and the Zuni reservation to the south. It's a little smaller, and there are two different types of cultures. The Zunis are more of a Pueblo culture. They, they tend to live closely packed together in their cities, kind of like uh, if you've seen pictures of the Taos Pueblo. Uh, it's kind of like that. The Navajo are different. They're more nomadic, and they prefer to live way, way away from their neighbors. They like to be alone. Um, they raise sheep. A lot of the traditional ones still do. And um, I search for something. I search for something to write about that I knew about. I heard that is what you do. And since I was inspired by Tony Hillerman's books, who wrote about another Navajo policeman in that area from the, the, more, in the more modern times, I decided to write about New Mexico and the ancient cultures, uh, but in more of a mystery type fashion with a policeman and so forth. Um, when I read that uh, you should write what you know, you should also write something that is a little unusual, something uh, that's uh, unique, and I had to take stock of just what I knew about that I could write about, that people would be interested. I didn't think people cared much for insurance agents. <laughs> I, I suspected that, I just didn't, didn't know for sure. Uh, bankers, same thing, so it had to be something else. Uh, you know, you can write about writing a song or something, but, you know, who cares unless you can listen to it. So, I, <laughs> I just remembered as a kid, I loved comic books. Uh, especially the horror comics and the science fiction comics, and I confess I still own 3,000 comic books. <laughs> and I don't know what to do with them. I don't want to get rid of them, but... <laughs> so, um, I, as a fan of comic books, I started looking into the history of comics. And as a, a bit of an artist, I had my favorite uh, artists, the ones that drew with pen and ink, not the uh, painted comics you see today or the computer uh, made comics. Uh, they, they use pen and ink and a paintbrush. And I learned how to emulate some of those, some of those uh, artists. The first book I ever read was The Beasts of Tarzan, so I liked adventure too. Uh, I don't know how that book ever got into our house, and it was a hardback too, and it was old, it belonged to somebody, but that was the first book I read. And then I went to the, to the West Branch Library, and I believe I read every science fiction book on the shelf. So when I say I, me and libraries go back a long way, and I love libraries. So I was influenced by comics, and I looked into the early uh, comics that were done in the 20s and 30s, which is how I got uh, into, interested in the 30s. Uh, most comics then were the funny pages, and they would reprint comics that way, but there were a lot of pulp magazines, westerns, uh, science fiction. Every writer that wanted to get started, that's where you got your stuff published. He didn't make much, but that's, that's what he knew. The stories were pretty hard hitting and they snapped and uh, a little lurid at times, but that's, uh, that's what people liked to read back then. Superman comics. Uh, Superman first made his appearance in 1937. So I looked back in there and though I could never own one of those things, I wanted to find out what just, what was it about the 30s that inspired so much writing and so much art. And I did some research and here is what I found. And some of you may have also done some research that way, but I found that uh, it's a lot similar to what we're dealing with today and what we've dealt with our last 10 years or so. 
There was a drought going on back then in the 30s. Remember the Great Dust Bowl? That was late 20s and 30s. We were just getting out of the Depression and we couldn't seem to crawl out of it. It just kept dragging on and on and on. And the uh, Conservation Corps was created to put people to work. Unemployment was close to 20% one time. The threat of war in Europe, how does that sound like today's news? China and Japan were battling. In the 1930s, people had a lot of reason to look into their imaginations. That's where they got their escape. And I think that's why those magazines and comics and other things like that were so popular. Radio was part of the media then. All the serial stories, the crime fighters and the westerns and all that sort of thing. Movies were wildly popular. They talk now. And just think, it, it took to 1969 for a man to step on the moon. Back in the 30s, Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers, they were rocketing to other planets. So it's, it took a while to catch up to that. Technology was booming then. They had dirigibles, which are balloons with a rigid frame inside it. And they were as long as two and a half football fields long. Now, can you imagine something as big as an ocean liner flying over your head? Just, it's, it just, I can't even believe it. I, I, it's astounding. TV was just invented. You didn't have a set in your living room yet, but they invented it. The scientists also knew about DNA. They probably didn't know what to do with it yet. But they did know what to do with the atom, because they made an atomic bomb. There's something else that I was just amazed to learn about. They actually invented pop-top beer cans back then. <laughs> I was astounded. New Mexico had only been a state for about 20 years, a little over 20 years, and the major east-west highway that went through the middle of the state was being improved, it was being widened, bridges uh, uh, rebuilt, and the road used to go from Texas through the middle of the state, but before it hit Albuquerque, it went up the mountain range to Santa Fe, and then around the other side of the mountain came back before it headed out west, so they straightened that out put a canyon through the mountains, and they renamed it after they paved it. They renamed it Route 66. Oh. So New Mexico became, I'm getting choked up just thinking, Route 66. <laughs> the mother of America and New Mexico finally joined that, uh, that, that long route. There was something else that I knew that I liked that I'd like to incorporate in, in my writing, and that was, uh, I just loved the first Indiana Jones movie. Just, it, it took place in that era, so to speak, and I just loved the, the action, you know, the modernizing of some of the action. It was kind of like one of the old cliffhanger serials. Um, another movie I liked a lot was Romancing the Stone. I, I love the action and the places. I like the way the characters' relationships just kind of snap and spark, a little bit of humor. Um, I wanted to write like that. There was one other author that I uh, emulated uh, that I really liked, and that's Clive Cussler, especially his early books. He used to start his books with uh, a prologue. And I know some writers don't like to use prologues when they write, but he always started with that. And he would start out with uh, something that happened in ancient times. A ship sank or was lost or a, a treasure was lost. And then as the book progressed, that, that treasure or that ship was rediscovered and came into play in the story. And I wanted to use that type of thing. So I use a prologue. And uh, I still like his works. 
I'd like to read you the first chapter of this book, a <coughs> prologue, but the first chapter is rather short. And if I may, chapter one, July 21st, 1935, Northwestern New Mexico. Old man Assidy was so out of breath that his vision was starting to blur. Stars flashed in his head and his chest ached from the stress of running in the 90 degree heat. He stumbled desperately on weak legs. His dry tongue rolled across spittle-flecked lips. He feared that the pain in his chest meant that his heart would stop and he would die, just as a young white doctor at the Indian hospital had told him. You have a sick heart? Your arteries are hard and clogged with too much fat? The doctor knew that Atsley would never consent to an operation, so he warned him not to observe himself. He'd given him some nitroglycerin pills, pills that were sitting on the top of the dresser in the log hogan, 100 feet in front of him. Atsidi gasped noisily as he lost his balance and twisted his foot on a slab of shale. He fell, gouging his knee on a sharp rock and tumbled to the bottom of a shallow wash. His heart beat like a jumping animal in his chest, fighting to free itself from the bone and flesh that held it captive. He could smell the high desert dust that stuck to the sweat on his face, and he sobbed in pain as he struggled to get up. His grandson was due to come home in a few more days. If only he were here now. In his mind, he could still see his great-granddaughter, the young girl lying like a bloody rag doll next to the partially eaten carcasses of the sheep she tended. A haze of blue bottle flies pulsed around her in the afternoon heat. It looked as if the air was alive above her torn body. He'd all, he had scarcely a chance to react to the grisly sight when he saw the abomination. His skin had tingled in an odd way. His body felt loose inside and his hair stood up in the back of his neck. He realized that the large creature, still busy feeding on a sheep carcass, had not noticed him yet. Atsini had crouched in the low brush and backed away from the carnage, mentally cursing himself for not bringing along his rifle when he'd left the Hogan, looking for young Sarah. Easing behind a rocky outcrop, his heart had suddenly throbbed with pain. Clutching at his chest, he'd bent over, trying to stifle a moan that he was sure the beast had heard. Then he had run as fast as he could back toward his log Hogan over the low hill ahead of him. The old Navajo grunted as he spat dirt from his mouth and rose to his hands and knees from the sandy wash. He could hear the eerie bark of the creature closing the gap behind him. Atsidi hissed in pain as he regained his feet. He loped and staggered the remaining distance to his door. He felt the beast nearly upon him. And fearing to look back, he quickly pulled himself inside and threw the door shut. He spun around and fumbled for the wooden plank. It dropped to secure the opening just as a heavy body crashed against the door. Atsidi jumped back. The door held. He rushed for his carbine and quickly levered a shell into the firing chamber. He remembered the nitro nitroglycerin pills. He reacted or reached with his left hand to the top of the narrow chest of doors, grabbed for the pill bottle, and knocked a handful of other items to the floor. Clawing at the lid, he finally slipped a capsule into his mouth, and soon his breathing came easier and the throbbing pain in his chest began to fade. He listened to the creature moving outside. He heard it panned as it circled a small six-sided cabin, then silence. He looked around the dusty room until his eyes stopped at the small window. Was it large enough for the monster to gain entry? Maybe. He set the rifle down, grabbed for the mattress on his bed, and threw it against the window. And spilling the remaining articles from the desk drawers, he dragged it against the mattress. And in the quiet gloom, he sat down on an old kitchen chair with his rifle across his knees. He turned his head left and right, and he strained to hear any movement from the beast. Still silence. Atsidi let out his breath. He slowly rose and stepped across the room, only he stumbled into a tin kettle that had fallen to the floor in his early frenzy. The kettle clattered noisily off to the cast iron stove in the center of the room, and in response, the creature shrieked outside. With a loud creak, the roof heaved, placing Rivlets of dust and dirt was sifted through the waddle of branches crisscrossing the ceiling. The dirt roof, could the beast get through the roof? 
Digging noises sent a chilling shiver down the old man's back. Strange panting and barking sounds came from the creature in its efforts to bore fruit, causing it to become even more agitated. In the cloying darkness, the wave of calm slowly washed over the old Navajo. His courage and his strength began to return and he realized at last who the creature really was. He remembered the story, passed on from generation to generation, from his grandfather, from his grandfather's grandfather, and back to the very beginning of the people. Back to when the ancients had crawled up to the surface of the earth from the underground and were set upon by a monster. The beast of the ancient creation legends had come back. Ant said he would die, of course. No mortal man could stand against the spirit god. The digging above had become more frantic. Time is running out. Ant said he reached to a low shelf and found a writing pad and a small box of pencils. He must warn someone. He knew neighbors might stop by in a few days. Perhaps his grandson would finally return. He wrote one word in large double-stroke letters and left the page in the dust on the kitchen table. Retrieving his rifle, he began to sing a warrior's chant. He would not die in this hogan. His ghost spirit would be free rather than trapped inside these walls. The roof shook as branches snapped and large chunks of dirt fell to the floor. Already the old man could see dusty beams of light shining through the ceiling. It would be only a moment or two before the beast dug its way through. Atsidi reached inside his shirt for the medicine bundle hanging from a leather thong around his neck. He held the greasy pouch in his hand and thought of the small items it held. Corn pollen, a small bone, an animal tooth, and a feather. He then thought of his lovely great-granddaughter and spoke in a loud, determined voice. It is not a bad thing to die well. Gritting his teeth, he lifted the latch and quickly stepped out the door away from the Hogan. He turned and fired and levered and fired again and again at the horrible fiend on the roof. A loud scream of pain and anger burst from the creatures that leapt upon the, from the roof upon the old man and drove him to the ground, raking its scimitar-like claws across his belly and throat. Acidy yelled his defiance, and blood sprayed from his lips in the last gush of air as the creature's jaws bit down and crushed his chest. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's how the story starts. <laughs> Uh, I'd said before I had to learn how to write, and uh, I read a lot. I, I remember years and years ago, after reading a particularly good science fiction book that I, I liked, I was going to write a book, then I got a page and a half and realized I had no clue what I was doing. Threw it away, threw it away. So I had to become a student of the business, so to speak. I read books and articles. I learned by doing, trial and error. I read, read and read. And I read somewhere that an author will rewrite his works, his or her works, 20 times. <laughs> I didn't want to rewrite this thing 20 <laughs> times, <clears throat> but I did. Uh, and it reminded me of something else. Uh, when in painting a picture, yeah. I have a, a nice big picture in, in my house. It's about four foot by five foot. It's about the Inca city Machu Picchu. And you've probably seen pictures of that. And it took me a while to do that and finish it. And the steps I took, I had to gather resource material, pictures, photos, what kind of angle I wanted to paint that picture from. I had to prepare the canvas I laid out the shapes, the backgrounds, the colors in the background, and added layer upon layer of detail. Changing what didn't work, keep working on it until I was satisfied with it. And I can tell you, I pushed a paintbrush down every street of that city, over every wall and across every rock. And that's, I think, how writing is. So I wrote it and rewrote it 20 times. 
it's a process. <clears throat> I'd like to say one thing before I open it up to any questions, that uh, the most important thing I learned was that it's all about the characters. It's not about the location or the time or the country. It's all about the characters. And if there are any authors in here, you know to give your characters significant flaws. Because if you don't, people won't care about them. You won't care about them. But if they have flaws, they have something to overcome. They have something that guides them. And they'll help an author write the story. And I became friends with several of my characters. And I hated another several of them. But they all helped me write the book. Any questions? Yes, sir. It doesn't really have anything to do with your book, but one being an author. I have a daughter who's a history major, and she would love to get a job like doing history research for an author. Do you have any idea how she would get about go about doing something like that? Have you ever used any assistance or anything? Well, uh, one thing she could do, and this is just off the top of my head, she could um, start blogging <clears throat> and offering those services. Uh, if you all know what I mean, just blogging about writing in general and offer those services. She could also join a writer's group and meet other authors who may not like her services or so forth. Um, Anybody else have any other ideas? But that, uh, that you, you bring a, a good point up. Thanks to Google, uh, it's a little easier, but it's, there, there are some projects that just require a lot of research, and it does take time. And if I was getting into one of those projects, I think I would like to hire someone to do that. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Yes, ma'am. Um, when you're writing uh, this story, for instance, how, how did you match up actual history uh, of what was going on in that community with your story? Uh, that's a very fair question. <clears throat> this, this is a, a work of fiction, so I've been a little loose with history. A little loose. Uh, I use history just to, oh, just to anchor parts of the story and give the reader a, a, a feeling of when that was and what else was going on. Uh, as far as the history of the culture of uh, the Native Americans, um, National Geographic is a, a great place to read about things. In fact, I've got a couple of geographics there that show pictures of Chaco Canyon and some of those areas if you want to take a, a look at it when you come by. Um, the, um, I, I, I was wondering about the, the Nazi and the uranium. Was that sort of a factual thing or not? No. Uh, they were looking for uranium, but to my knowledge, they didn't go on the reservation. It could have happened, though. Could have. Um, when, when, uh, when, when you write a, a book of fi fiction, your job is to create a suspension of disbelief. You know, people, I don't believe there's a monster. I don't believe there's Nazis in New Mexico. But uh, when you read the book, I'll bet you believe it. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, can you tell about how you got the book published? Yes. It, <laughs> I, <clears throat> that was another thing I had to learn. And um, what I did was uh, I was told that uh, you can't find a publisher if you're a new author, and, which is true. I found that out. I sent out query letters uh, to, oh my gosh, maybe 60 or so writer's agents. And maybe 10 replied with a no thank you. The rest just ignore you. You know, they want to know what you already published. Um, even five years ago, major publishers were really scared. They didn't know what was going on in the publishing business because ebooks were just growing like, growing like crazy. And now they've kind of slipped back a bit. 
people like paper books. Um, so I went and realized I had to self-publish. Fortunately, there is a whole industry that's grown up to fit that audience. And my gosh, there's five or six main publishers. I picked three of them and researched the packages and their costs and chose the one that I was going to have published. Did that answer your question? So I, I guess if I were to recap a, a new author, unless you're the, uh, the cousin of Mr. Patterson or Mr. King or something like that, who's kind of pushing you to his agent, you're going to self-publish until you can uh, get a name for yourself. And you may have to publish two, three, four. Yes, sir. I just had a question. When you're writing this uh, fiction, do you write it at a certain time of the, the day or the night, set yourself some time, go off in a corner and then start writing this? Or do you ever go when you go to sleep and then you're thinking maybe about it, you wake up and say, oh, I've got to go and write, write this down. Yeah. And then, I was just curious. Well, I, I, I would have paid you to ask me that question. <laughs> um, most uh, authors, have trouble finding time to write. Since I'm retired, I didn't necessarily have a big problem with that. And being, uh, actually running my own business as an insurance agent for a while, I'm a pretty much a self-starter, but I just, I set up a section uh, in a den, and that's where I went to write. So when I was in there, if I didn't write, I'd wander around until I said, oh, well, I'll write, I'll write. Uh, I got to the point of uh, thinking that I got to write, not have to write. I got to write. Um, I'm going to expand on that question a little bit, if I may. I kept a notebook with me at all times, uh, and one by uh, the bed. Wake up in the middle of the night, write something down. And that's how I gathered material for not only this book, but I've, I've got a folder of scratchy notes, enough to do six more. Uh, sometimes in the morning, when you read those notes, they don't make a lot of sense. But uh, because you try to write in the dark, and you, know, you write sideways across the page. And so yes, to answer the other part of your question, you're always taking notes. If, if you can't use it in your current book, the chances are you can use it in the second book. Um, if, uh, if I could ask, how many people in this room are actually writers? Hmm. Okay. Um, I want to mention a few things about writing. For those of you that uh, may not be writers, but might be thinking of doing some writing, and that is just get started. Uh, I can guarantee that the first pages you write are probably not going to be very good. It doesn't matter. It's just to get something on paper, because remember, you're going to rewrite it 20 times, and you can make a lot of changes uh, over that period of time. You need to become a student of the business. You need to read about technique. You need to learn punctuation. Boy, that was my big, big struggle. Um, join a uh, writer's group. That was the best thing I ever did, because I got at least a dozen people that had a different opinion about things than I did. And it gave me an idea what my audience might think, because they weren't going to think like I did. Find a beta reader. When you finish your book and you think you've gone through it 16, 17 times, have someone read it that reads a lot. They'll tell you, ah, this part stinks. This part's slow. Ah, this character would not say that. Now, my wife is my beta reader, and she'll tell me. She loves to tell me. <laughs> and it, uh, it makes me a better writer. So I, 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 I couldn't pay someone to, uh, 
to give me that kind of feedback. Um, so I have uh, my second book I'm working on right now. Uh, I'm at about the 18th time through it. Um, I've still got a few more things I want to tweak and uh, to make sure it's ready. And I, I have a special problem because I, I've had such good reception to Black Sparrow that I, I can't screw up now. <laughs> this, the second book has got to be half again better for people to think it's just as good. And that's what I'm trying to do. The second book is called White Feather and it picks up right where Black Sparrow ends and I would hope to publish it sometime next year. My third book is in a partial draft. I haven't thought of a title yet, but I've got a, a whole folder of notes that I've called through and uh, I'm starting to work on that or I will be very shortly. And I've still got a very, very thick folder for many, many of the projects I've always had and stuff, notes to it. So that was to expand your question. I, I'm surprised there weren't that many writers in this group. Usually I, I find at least a handful. And I bet some of you are just, well, I write a little yeah, bit. Sure. I could raise my hand. <laughs> Any other questions? Following through with the same character in the second book and the third book, same main character. Mm -hmm. I didn't plan on doing Are that. Are you in love with him? <laughs> <laughs> He's my type, but uh, but I do like his character. And in, in fact, when I uh, wrote Black Sparrow, uh, the main character was going to be the pilot, the young pilot. And I got through maybe 100 pages or so. And uh, my beta reader said, oh no, that's not your main character. It's Sam Begay, the, Na the Navajo policeman. I said, oh, okay. Um, you, so you lived 20 or 30 years? 20 years. Huh? 20 years in New Mexico, and then came back to Michigan. Mm -hmm. um, most people retired to the <laughs> well, I, but I came from Michigan in the first place, and I did it all backwards. Um, let me talk about that for just a, a second. Uh, I can remember being a, a little kid and having a reoccurring dream of, uh, I walked out of this building that was like a, like a bank building when they had those wooden fences in front of the desks, and walked out the door, and there was a, a porch, and then desert with uh, cactuses and mesas in the distance and a buzzard flying around. And, and I can still remember it to this day. And I think I was destined to go out west for some time. But the real uh, epiphany happened when I moved back to Michigan. I had forgotten what, a, what part of maritime culture plays in the state. I had forgotten it. I thought of Michigan as trees, rivers, lakes. But when I came back, the first thing I wanted to, to learn about again was the shipping on the Great Lakes. And it, it, it surprised me. I could not believe it. I kind of like working with New Mexico and Michigan because my character goes back to Michigan every once in a while. The second book, the same thing. And I like the opposites that they are. Michigan with so much water and rain, and New Mexico mostly dry. They have lakes, but they're, they're as big as your front yard. They dam up a few rivers to have some bigger lakes. Um, some people say it's 100,000 square miles of kitty litter, but it's, 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 it's nicer than that. They have mountains and trees and, and, and just incredible culture. The, the art that these artists do out there, it's, oh, Santa Fe is a, is, a, is a miracle at Christmas time. If you ever have to find yourself going to New Mexico or Santa Fe, go in the Christmas time. It's just wonderful. But one thing I learned when I moved back to Michigan is that the rain here is incredible. I, I remember as a kid I hated the rain because I couldn't go camp. I couldn't play. When I came back, 
I love to stand outside and listen to the rain. It could rain out in New Mexico and you see the clouds in the distance coming towards you and you see the rain falling and it never touches the ground. It evaporates before it hits the ground. So I love the rain. I think it's the most incredible thing. Yes, Enjoy hearing you talk. Um, I've been to a couple of talks about lighthouses and these haunted lighthouses. And of course, there have been some stories written about them, but that might be something you might consider for your fifth or sixth book. <laughs> Coincidentally, um, uh, one of my characters, the, uh, there's a young pilot named Kip Combs who comes from Michigan, and he grew up in a lighthouse. <laughs> Boy, that's, uh, I, I may need to re revisit that. That's incredible. We've got some Indians here, too. Pardon? We've got some Indians here, too. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Um, my second book has uh, Sam Begay. <clears throat> Uh, coming back to Michigan, uh, he has uh, been coerced to uh, assist someone back in Washington in a, in a police organization to help uh, find a, uh, an Indian up in the Lupton area uh, that used to know some people in the Purple Gang. So he comes back for a couple of weeks and he gets off the train at West Branch and goes through Rose City to Lupton and goes up through the Maltby Hills and just, it's raining and it's muddy and he just can't stand it. It's driving him nuts. And when he finally goes back and it's raining on the train, he came to think, this rain is just incredible. He said he'd never forget it. So you can take your life experiences and find nice ways to put it in a book. Anybody else? I, I have to say this has just been a wonderful time for me. And I love the questions you folks have had. And I want to thank everybody in the basic library system for allowing me to come in and speak with you. Thank you. Oh, by the way, I should say this. If, uh, and since this is a library function, if you would like to purchase a copy of the book, uh, you, there's some pricing on this sheet that I passed out, forget that. Uh, because it's a library function, you can have at the same price I would sell them to the library. The paperbacks would be $15. Uh, and a few hardbacks, you can have those for $25. And I'll sign them and say anything you'd like to say. Them. <laughs>